I take great pleasure in announcing tonight's speaker, Dr. Lizanne Henderson, Senior Lecturer from the School of Social and Environmental Sustainability at Glasgow University. And she teaches history, tourism, and human animal studies. One main area of her research is Scottish witch hunts and supernatural belief traditions. So without further ado, I'd like you to introduce you all to Lizanne, um, Dr. Lizanne Henderson, whose talk is on Northern Malefice, witch hunting and witch beliefs in the Scottish Highlands. Over to you then, Lizanne. Thank you. So welcome. Thank you for that kind introduction. And um, firstly, just want to congratulate the museum on your opening. I am very much looking forward to coming to see it and possibly dragging some of my students along <laughs> with me because it sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, I'd also like to apologize to those of you who um, uh, tried to hear the talk last year and I had to unfortunately postpone. Um, I've been going through a rather terrible time in my personal life. I'm still trying to deal with it. But anyway, you're not here to hear about my um, uh, troubles. Let us instead discuss the troubles of the notable number of women and men who were suspected and in many cases persecuted for a crime that we now know is probably not possible, but for most people living in the early modern uh, period of Scotland was all too possible. Now, before we narrow in on the Highlands, I want to provide you with a kind of wider context of the Scottish witch hunts that occurred from about the mid 16th to the early 18th century. Why do we see a rise in which prosecutions in Scotland in this period? We don't really have time to get into all these details, but it's just things to get your minds thinking. Um, after all, witchcraft had existed as a concept long before the Scottish Witchcraft Act of 1563 was enacted, uh, but witchcraft was becoming a far more terrifying construct. Growing associations between witches and the devil made witches a much bigger threat, not only to the individual, but to society um, at large. Witch trials were, of course, not constrained to Scotland, but happened across much of Europe. There were trials in Spain and Italy, uh, in the Alpine regions, uh, really from as early as the fifth, kind of early period of the 15th century. In Germany, which was arguably the worst affected area, had its first trials in the 1480s. England, getting a little bit closer, had its first large-scale trials in the 1560s. Um, if we're looking at the highest concentration of European witch hunting, that was re it's really falling in the period from about the 1570s mm -hmm. to the 1660s is when we see the highest number of trials. And these dates are actually very comparable to the Scottish experience as well. After the 1660s, in most places, we see uh, the number of trials decline. There are some variations to that pattern, such as in the 1670s, Sweden and Finland had quite late trials. And of course, the more famous um, episode uh, across the Atlantic at Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 is comparatively late. Now, the inspiration behind the uh, Scottish witch hunts comes from predominantly from the ruling classes, from the ministers, from the lay judges. Church and state were concerned about non-conformity and really quite repressive steps were taken to discourage unofficial sources of empowerment. And that would include things like witchcraft. Now that's not to say that ordinary folk had no influence. They most certainly did. And in, what we really see is a kind of intermingling of belief at all levels of society, which are helping to shape demonic conceptualizations. Now, the very first um, large scale witch hunt in Scotland is um, generally considered to be the North Berwick trials of 1590 to 91, mostly um, around the Edinburgh um, area and, and of course, North Berwick. Uh, it's notable or notorious 
not only because it involved around 300 suspects, so that was very, very large indeed for these times, but because it directly involved the king, King James VI. Uh, later, he becomes uh, the first of England. James went on to write about his hatred of witches and his kind of personal experience with them, uh, the damage that he thought that they were doing to the country um, in his book, Demonology of 1597. Um, just to give you a little passage from that, to give you a flavor for what this is like, he says, the great wickedness of the people procures this horrible defection, whereby God justly punishes sin. The consummation of the world and our deliverance drawing near makes Satan to rage the more in his instruments, knowing his kingdom to be so near an end. Now you can see in this short passage, the kind of language that's being used it's very apocalyptic in the language. It's very frightening, really kind of ramping up the fear. Um, it's also blaming the people <laughs> that they are to fault, you know, at fault. You know, it's interesting how some things never change in society. Um, it, it's always somehow the little people that are blamed for all the ills in society. And this is no exception. Now, the criminal prosecution of which is actually dates back earlier than North Berwick, um, actually to the reign of James's mother, Mary Queen of Scots, a very uh, well-known figure in Scottish history. Uh, it was during her reign that the Witchcraft Act, the kind of piece of legislation that puts um, the prosecution of witches into an act of law, that's under her reign, um, and that comes into act. Uh, that act comes into uh, being in 1563. There were other legislative acts that followed. I'm not going to mention them all, but there's one that's worth mentioning um, in 1573. So not that much long, not, not you know, not a huge amount of time after. The Privy Council um, decreed witchcraft a crime in exceptum, which basically means an exceptional crime. Now, that had huge legal implications for how they would conduct uh, the trials. So, for example, it would allow females to act as witnesses, which wasn't normally the case. Women were not supposed to be witnesses in a, in a, in a court of law. So if it's an exceptional crime, that kind of goes out the window. Now, on pretty much the same as on the continent, there was not one continuous uh, witch hunt in Scotland, uh, but rather a, a, it undergoes a kind of fluctuation of uh, highs and lows. The, the great Christina Larner, who is uh, you know one of the, the kind of authorities on the subject, um, she uh, discovered that there were five major peaks uh, of quite intense, what she described as national panics, I'll, I'll just get to that in a moment. Um, and the dates that she had, they've been slightly modified, but they're more or less the same as what Christina Larner, they're there in the PowerPoint. It's not going to write, you know, read out all the dates. Uh, but there you can see the kind of highest uh, peaks of intensity um, of witch trial activity. So spanning from the 1590s trial at North Berwick to the kind of big national outbreak in 1661. Um, there has been a suggestion that another serious outbreak actually occurred in 1568 as well. So we can actually probably talk about uh, six major peaks rather than five. Now, this word national panic is quite interesting that Larner refers to because, you know, you could argue that Scotland never really had a national panic in the truest sense of the word. Uh, because some areas of the country it remained really quite unaf completely unaffected or maybe very limited, like maybe just a one or two um, experiences of witch trials, um, which isn't really a national panic in that in that sense. It's also it has been estimated that approximately 65 percent of Scottish parishes had no formal prosecutions at all. And by extension, no first-hand experience of witch persecution. Therefore, direct exposure to witch hunting isn't really the norm. It's not a normal activity as such. Um, 
it's not really representative of most people's experience um, um, of, of crime or, or even of witchcraft. And one of the areas that had very few formal trials, or so 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 has been said, is the Highlands. And we'll get in, into this in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Now, throughout Europe, just to give you some statistics, we're looking at, in, in Europe, between around 1400 to 1775, we're looking at around 100,000, possibly up to 110,000 trials. Um, for men and women, uh, around 50 to 60,000 of those people we know were executed. It's very difficult to be precise with this because some of the records uh, they either don't tell you or the records have been lost or so on and so forth. Looking at Scotland, the evidence that we have has um, come up with 3,837 known trials. Um, though, again, that number, it sounds very precise, but it's not because in some of the trials, it doesn't actually give you the precise uh, number of people who were investigated. So it's probably closer to 4,000 or possibly even slightly higher. And of that number, we assume about half of them were executed. So it was possible to be found innocent of the crime and also um, uh, sometimes the cases just fell apart uh, for one reason or the other. The area of Scotland that was most affected uh, between 1563, when the witchcraft comes into, power, into action, and 1736, when it is repealed, um, is most definitely in the lowlands. And you can see that demonstrated there on the map. The kind of darker colour is where the highest concentration of cases are. Um, worst hit are the Lothians. It's not really a big surprise because that's where Edinburgh is. That's kind of where the source of uh, power is. And um, there are, you know, very compelling reasons as to why that area should experience the highest number. So it's coming in at 32%, Strathclyde, 14%, Fife, 12%, Aberdeenshire and the Grampians, um, uh, around 7%. Um, looking down here in the southwest or the border regions, slightly higher at 9%. Uh, and then, then it just kind of trickles down. We're going up to Orkney and Shetland. You're only getting about uh, 5% and a very, very small number, 2% in the central regions. What about the highlands and islands? It comes in at 6%, 6% of cases. What does 6% mean? Well, out of that number of trials, that comes down to around 230 known individual cases throughout the Highland region, 230. So that's not an insignificant number. It's actually really uh, quite high. Uh, Lauren Martin, she has since demonstrated that uh, per head of population, the percentage of cases in the Highlands was actually higher than some other areas of the country. Now, this is not the results that, that were once expected, because it's always been this assumption that the Highlands really didn't do witch hunting. Um, and there are reasons for saying that. They're, it's not entirely wrong, but it's not as insignificant as we had once thought. When we look at witch confessions, the other thing that's quite tricky here is that there are some consistent patterns that we can see, You know, some similarities that come up time and time again. But there really is no such thing as a typical Scottish uh, witch hunt. Um, each trial has its own dynamic, its own unique conditions, uh, set of circumstances. Um, some reveal more about learned ideas of witchcraft, uh, more kind of what the demonologists thought about witchcraft, what the, what the church thought, while others offer uh, really quite interesting glimpses into everyday life and what ordinary people thought uh, witchcraft was. So one of the things I find so fascinating about looking at the witchcraft evidence is it actually, it's almost like a window into uh, people's mindsets, their attitudes, their beliefs, the kind of customs they had, the relationships they had with one another, their emotions, their relationships with animals. There's all sorts of things that you can actually tease out of these records, not just uh, the belief in witches. But what exactly was a witch? I'm using this word 
uh, very casually here. And what was a witch in early modern Scotland? Because the concept of the witch actually changes quite significantly over time. Now, in lowland Scotland, we find witch is a very commonly used term, in including in the early modern period. Uh, we come across some other terminologies, comer, kimmer, carlin. Carlin just really means an old woman. Uh, wise wife is sometimes used to apply uh, to a, a witch or witch-like figure. Now, what's quite interesting here is in the Scottish Highlands, there was no native Gaelic word for a witch. It only seems to have entered the language as an influence from the lowlands in the second half of the 16th century. So when the witch hunts are kicking off in the lowlands, um, it enters into the Gaelic um, kind of purview, if you like. Gaelic scholar, uh, the late uh, John McInnes, charted the Gallic evolution of the concept of witch, noting that in the medieval period, the term to describe a woman with supernatural powers or, or witch, if you like, was ama, which also, uh, this can also carry the meaning of a foolish woman. So there's this kind of connection of you're foolish, you're, you're not really, um, uh, you don't have your wits about you kind of thing, which is perhaps why you've been drawn to witchcraft. This term ama was uh, displaced by bushach, um, and bushach seems to have been derived from the English witch. Now, the implications of this, you might think, well, so what? Uh, but McInnes claimed that this is actually quite important, for it was suggesting a perhaps a new kind of witch or concept of the witch coming into Gallic society at this moment in time. Now, the other thing that's quite interesting in, in these early days, Bushach is actually the masculine. It refers to a male witch. That may or may not be relevant because sometimes we use the male form of words, even when we're referring to both men and women. Um, so that's not necessarily um, conclusive. Um, nowadays, uh, Bushach, Bushach is usually confined to folktale. So you come ac across it in folktales, a much more common a terminology with the feminine prefix now is banavushach, um, which some of you may well be familiar with that term. Now, defining what a witch was or is, because after all, some people still believe in witchcraft in other parts of the world and, and, and even in this part of the world, um, it does vary across the world. The basic threats of witchcraft tend to be much the same. Um, it's all about hurt, damage, uh, infertility, destruction, conflict between neighbors, that kind of thing. Um, though the specific characteristics can, of course, differ across cultures and geographical regions. Now, many of those differences, they tend to be related to the means of subsistence. So, for example, you know, a vineyard owner in Austria, he might attribute loss of his grapes uh, uh, to hailstorms caused by witches, while in coastal Scandinavia, witches were blamed for driving away the fish. In Scottish lowland farming uh, communities, uh, loss of livestock or interference with dairy yields um, were commonly associated with witchcraft. While in coastal towns and villages, you, you tend to find more maritime issues coming up, such as sinking ships, drownings, depletion of fish stocks, that kind of thing, um, occasionally attributed to witches. Associations between witchcraft and bad weather, which is a kind of a common motif, doesn't appear to have been as dominant in Scotland as in other parts of continental Europe. Um, Scottish witches were generally more, you know, kind of more regularly coupled with more uh, acts of general misfortune, or this term that was very commonly used from the Latin maleficium um, or malefice, which is how it's usually interpreted in Scots, uh, simply as uh, harmful magic. That is what witches did. So there, was, there wasn't really a concept of witches as being good. They were always seen as being uh, bad. They were always seen in a negative light, uh, by and large. There's one or two exceptions to that, but very few. Witches were well known for using charms and cursing. That tended to be uh, how they enacted their magic, was through their words, as opposed to, you know, um, fancy books or tools. Sometimes they talk about those kinds of things, but that's not really uh, common. 
In the Highlands, we find that some witches possessed the evil eye. Though other people say witches and the evil eye are different, it can get a bit confusing. The other thing that's quite confusing when we're talking about what is a witch is a, a witch could be different depending on who you were. So folk beliefs about uh, what witches were were often quite different from what the church or the secular authorities were claiming a witch was. Uh, really quite different, actually. So, for example, in uh, folk traditions, um, they might accept the reality of witches shape-shifting into animals. That might be part of your belief system. Uh, lots of people thought that witches could take the form of a cat or a crow or a hare. Very, very common uh, across uh, much of Scotland, and including in the Highlands. A concept that was deeply divisive um, among learned opinions. So most uh, learned folks uh, commentating on this did not actually believe in animal metamorphosis. They, they would explain it more as an illusion of the devil. From the folk perspective, witches usually acted alone or perhaps with the assistance of the fairies. However, the authorities were much more troubled. They didn't really care about these things. They were more troubled that witches gathered in covert groups and uh, received their powers from the devil. That's what they were more concerned with. Within learned witchcraft theory, witches were thought to attend sab uh, uh, satanic Sabbath meetings where they entered into a demonic pact, a kind of formal ceremony when the witches renounced their baptism and received a bite or a nip, a physical uh, mark on their body, which kind of sealed the agreement with the devil. Some claim to have had sexual intercourse with the devil. Um, mostly this was reported as very painful and not a very pleasant experience, so it has to be said. Um, discovery of the devil's mark, you know, some part on the body that the, wit the, that the devil had touched or bitten or nipped her was, was actually, if you could find that spot, it could be used as evidence in a court of law. The mark itself was thought to be insensible to pain. That was one way you could find it by a procedure, a very horrible procedure known as pricking the witch, which is just as it sounds, taking a very long needle and poking the person all over their body and their head, under their armpits and the genital areas, your feet everywhere, looking for a spot that was insensitive to pain. And that was seen to be... Um, uh, possible evidence of where the devil had marked you. When misfortunes or disasters occurred, many people believed that God was punishing them for sin or maybe perhaps for a, for a weakness of faith. Others considered witchcraft to be an equally plausible explanation. Now, the source of the witch's power was quite extraordinary. It was unnatural and it was believed to be demonically inspired, at least by the authorities. Yet the effects, when we actually look at what, what was the target of witchcraft, it quite often was directed towards disrupting really quite ordinary or natural or commonplace events. So for example, you know, cows failing to produ produce milk, butter turning rancid, a child becoming ill, sudden death in the family, the kinds of things that happen in life, right, were quite often ascribed to uh, witchcraft. So the witch figure, in other words, represented uh, disharmony, imbalance, and chaos in everyday life. Witches were seen um, as the enemy of the church uh, and a threat to the stability of society. Even more menacing was that the witch operated from within society. The witch was often a well-known member of the community. It was somebody that you knew. Um, she or he might be a relative. They might be your next door neighbor. So unlike you know, demons or poltergeists or that sort of a thing, witches were not externally driven supernatural forces, but they were living, breathing people, a tangible reality, uh, so witchcraft was, was seen more as a constant threat. Furthermore, the devil was not an abstract concept either, trapped within the pages of the Bible, but the devil could also assume corporeal form. Uh, he could take any disguise of his choosing, so you didn't necessarily know you were encountering the devil, 
He might appear as an animal. He might appear as a man. He might appear as a woman. He may have spoken to you in your way to market. He may have come into your house, uh, possibly without even your knowledge. He could enter your thoughts. Now, under such high levels of anxiety, it's not that much of a stretch to understand how the seeds of witchcraft could blossom um, into full-scale uh, witch persecution. Now, we've kind of set the scene here. I want to get into some specifics now. So I want to tell you uh, just briefly a story um, in from nine from sorry from 1727 from 1727 an old woman by the name of Janet Horn from Loth in Sutherland the story goes um she was brought before a blazing fire in Dornoch uh the story says that the woman warmed herself thinking that the fire had been lit to take the chill from her bones and not as was intended to burn her to death for the monstrous crime of witchcraft. This is the story that is quite often attached to Janet. The trial of Janet Horn, it's, it's quite well known in academic, and indeed non-academic witchy circles, as being the case that put an end to the barbarous practice of burning witches in Scotland. It's also well known for some of the more unusual characteristics, such as Janet having ridden upon her own daughter, whom she had transformed into a pony. And of course, the image of this kind of poor, deluded old soul warming herself while the instruments of her torture were being prepared. All very heady stuff, probably not true. Um, most of those kind of more familiar parts of the story did not appear in print for some 92 years after the event. So it's very difficult to know um, what really went down. And certainly she would not have been warming herself by the fire. Like she would have already been strangled um, and in the middle of the fire, not standing on the outside of the fire. So there's a lot of problems with the story. But anyway, um, what is of most interest here for us is that it has become one of Scotland's uh, most frequently cited witchcraft cases and it's set in the Highlands. Um, is it not ironic that the area noted for its relative absence of which persecutions should become memorable as the part of Scotland that allegedly punished witches later than any other part of Scotland. Now, another irony, or I think so anyway, is that one of the earliest Scottish witch hunts in 1577 took place in Easter Ross, where six men and 26 women were arrested on charges of witchcraft. The thing to point out here is that among them was a man uh, by the name of Kenneth Orr, or Konya Hoare, um, better known as the Brand Seer of tradition. Uh, he was, and indeed is, uh, one of the best known prophets in Scottish history. And he was most likely executed as a witch in 1578. So we've got this kind of curious beginning and end story, starting in the Highlands and ending in the Highlands, but then, you know, we don't really associate witch hunting with the Highlands, so go figure. Now, we know the majority of witch trials were in the Lowlands. We can't dispute that. That's a fact. The Highland regions were largely, but not entirely, exempt from large-scale witch panics. But the lower uh, prosecution rate, this is not reflective of uh, diminished levels of belief in witches in the Galtacht, where... Um, people were probably just as likely to believe in supernatural forces as elsewhere in Scotland. So the explanation for the limited number of witchcraft trials must have been due to other factors. Now, there are several possibilities. I'm not saying I have the definitive answer here, but there are several possibilities that we can explore um, that, are, that suggest themselves as to why there's a difference in experiences between the Highlands and the Lowlands, uh, such as the perhaps there's a different conception of what constituted witch or witchcraft, the relatively uh, low demonic content um, in the Highland trials. The, the devil does not really appear as often in the Highland trials as he does in the Lowland trials. 
Uh, perhaps there was a higher toleration of witchcraft in the Highland regions or less exposure to demonological literature than in the lowlands or has been has but has been suggested a tendency to ascribe misfortunes to other supernatural forces as opposed to witches um i'll return to some of these points in a moment but just to sort of say generously you know uh, gen generally um a comparison of characteristics found in confessions across Scotland um, that, you know, I've done and others have done does not really reveal particularly strong regional distinctions. Um, this might, of course, change with future research because, you know, who knows what will happen with future uh, scholarship. We can detect a subtle Gallic element um, in the confessions there is perhaps a slightly stronger stress on charming in the uh, Highland cases, um, use of fairy charms and uh, Gallic spells. There's quite a big stress on the importance of dreams uh, and also the evil eye. Though I, I must point out that these elements are found in some of the lowland cases as well. I'm simply saying that there's there's a, maybe a more of a preponderance in the Highlands for those particular traits. Where we see perhaps slightly more distinction emerging is with the demonic aspects, uh, the you know things like attendance at witches' sabbats, entering into demonic pacts, having sexual relations with the devil, uh, flying through the night um, to get to the the, um, the kind of demonic uh, sabbats. So demonic interference is relatively low in the Highland witch testimonials. It is present. So, you know, for example, the devil had a significant part to play in the Butte uh, witch trials of 1662. Um, another area of magical practice that may have been more highly tolerated in the Highlands um, than in the Lowlands um, is second sight. Now, second sight is not witchcraft, but it's really, really just trying to tease out what was considered acceptable and what was considered unacceptable. So people like uh, the Reverend Rob Robert Kirk from Perthshire, among others, people like Martin Martin as well, uh, but we'll just stick with Kirk for the moment. Uh, he heavily defended the reality of second sight. Uh, it, he's living in um, the, the, the 17th century. Uh, he provides examples of the phenomenon uh, across the, the Geltacht as proof throughout his manuscript, the, uh, the Secret Commonwealth. He says, how do you solve this second sight from compact and witchcraft? By virtue of the fact that second sight is not a choice, but something that is entirely natural to some people. So in other words, he's saying it, it can't be the same as witchcraft uh, because you can't help it. It's just something that you're born with. That's his opinion. Um, there's other opinions out there, but we don't really have time to explore that. Now, similar to Ireland, Ireland incidentally also had uh, very low numbers of witchcraft trials, not absent, but not particularly high. Uh, the Highlands uh, did not produce much literature on the topic of witchcraft, uh, and, you know, kind of printed literature. The near absence of a print culture relating to witchcraft, this might be significant. Lack of exposure to the same levels of debate surrounding you know popular witchcraft theory possibly inhibited the drive uh, for witch persecutions but we have to consider um you know england it's just down to the south of us there england manufactured a massive amount of printed material on witchcraft lots of debates for and against witchcraft but england did not experience a particularly large witch hunt so you know, again, this is it's it's possibly a factor, but it's not really again definitive evidence. Uh, Ronald Hutton's proposition that Gaelic Scotland, again like Ireland, didn't have the same levels of fear of witches. Um, they didn't fear witches to the same extent as in the Lowlands. Um, was because they ascribed misfortune to other supernatural forces, uh, namely the fairies. Quite a compel he makes quite a compelling argument. Um, I personally remain to be convinced by this. This is just my opinion. You might have a different one. Um, 
he also makes an additional suggestion that the Gaelic Highland fairy was more malevolent than in the Scottish lowlands. I don't really know why he thinks that. Um, he really needs to read more about the the fairies in the lowlands because they're they're a pretty <laughs> they're a pretty nasty lot. So I'm not quite sure why he's saying this. In non-Gallic areas of Scotland, belief in fairies was just as strong, um, just as wicked, if you like. Um, and yet in the lowlands, uh, they had the strong desire to root out witches. So it doesn't quite work, in my opinion. Um, now, I'm not trying to deny um, that there is regional distinctiveness, but I am suggesting that there may be alternative explanations for the lower number of trials in the Geltacht. It might simply be the sheer size of the Highland region. It's a big area. That might it might just be as simple as that. Um, it could be because it was more or less um, it kind of cut off from uh, a lot of the central authorities, the legal frameworks uh, of uh, witch hunting, the judicial courts, which supported the prosecution of witchcraft. I think this must be quite an important factor. That just not having the same level of mechanisms to prosecute people for witchcraft must have been a factor. And when we do see, um, I don't think it's an accident that in Highland witch trials, when they do occur, they tended to be near coastal ports uh, or on the kind of frontier lines between the Highlands and Lowlands, places perhaps where exposure to Lowland ways of dealing with witchcraft could have taken hold more easily. It's just a suggestion. Again, I'm not saying it's right. It's just throwing it out there as a, as a thought. Another key issue which may have inhibited prosecutions or at least prevented accusations from you know, spiraling out of control um, was the uh, the role of the Kirk session, uh, which takes longer to establish itself in the Highlands. It eventually gets there, but it's a longer process. Uh, and also the involvement of the ministers. I think a lot more work has to be done on uh, the ministers in the Highlands who were involved in these cases to see uh, what their views were. Because we certainly see and this is being important in the lowlands. You know, um, the attitude of the minister could actually stop a witchcraft uh, trial going ahead if he didn't think there was anything in it. The uh, physical distance between neighbours might be a factor. Actually, just, you know, communication. You're not quite in the same, same degrees of in one another's faces um, when you've got these bigger parishes that might have allowed suspicions just to fizzle out, to take their natural course, or at least allow tempers to cool before um, things got out of control. The other thing, I'm, I'm not going to really dwell on this. Don't be alarmed by all the, the I'm not going to um, read all of this out. Um, the Highlands and Islands, I think we have to acknowledge there's been a perception about the Highlands and Islands as, be, as having a, a place having more traditions, as having more folklore, as being more superstitious. Quite often this is rooted in a, a, a deep disregard for the Highlands. Um, it, it's kind of writing them off as being somehow some kind of strange backwater where you know uh, people were more superstitious. Um, and yet the most severe punishment of witches takes place in the allegedly more civilized and supposedly less superstitious parts of the country. So it doesn't really follow. Um, but dis despite having fewer trials, there's a lot of opinions out there, like you can see there, W. Grant Stewart back in the 19th century, Otto Swire in the 60s, Anna Ross in the 70s, perpetuating this idea that uh, witchcraft or a belief in witches is more prevalent in the highlands um, as opposed to in the lowlands, which is a, you know, it's a very kind of topsy-turvy kind of a situation that we find ourselves in. Um, these prejudicial views aside, there is no doubt that the highlands and islands had a strong belief in the existence of witches. That's not really in question. It's this whole thing around witch hunting. Why do they have less cases? Um, we, we see common commentaries such as this one from the 70s, basically saying that on the witch hunting map of Scotland, the Highlands constituted a blank, that they really didn't happen there. 
Um, and he gives these various um, uh, reasons why. If you're interested in this PowerPoint, by the way, just let me know and I, I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, if you give me your, uh, if you email me, I can send it to you. Uh, Christina Larner, the name I mentioned earlier, uh, Enemies of God, in the otherwise excellent Enemies of God, um, she doesn't really focus, um, she's, she's kind of useless really when it comes to uh, Highland witch hunting. Um, she pretty much came to the conclusion that in the Highlands um, there was no witch hunting um, particularly of note, or at least none that reaches the records. She um, she kind of dismisses it. She mentions a few cases in Tain and Rosshire. Um, she mentions that Gallic patronymic names are rare. Uh, she says that uh, in the Highlands, witches are, are very rarely named, that they're just sort of anonymous figures like the fairies, that they're just these kind of threatening figures, but they're not actual real people. That's just not right. It's not true at all. Um, at least I've come to know some of them by name. Um, and she, she doesn't really have a lot to say um, on, on the topic. So we have to kind of consider, were there really as few cases as used to be generally accepted? In Larner's own study of this back in the 70s, they came up with uh, 89 trials. The more recent uh, survey that I mentioned, uh, the statistic I mentioned earlier of the 230, um, th this is obviously quite a big leap. It's gone from 89 to 230, quite a significant jump. Not a high percentage perhaps, but certainly comparable with say uh, places like the borders, which is coming in at, six, uh, at 9%. Was there really a different conception as to what witches were? what powers they possessed. I don't think so, personally. I don't think that, that it's really that different. Does witch belief continue longer in the Highlands, as is quite often suggested? Um, my own personal research has found evidence of very late witchcraft beliefs in lowland Scotland, including here in Dumfries and Galloway, where I sit right now. Um, was Gaelic society more tolerant of witches? Again, there's, this has been a common assumption uh, because of the fewer uh, witchcraft trials or official witchcraft trials. Uh, John McInnes, who I mentioned earlier, actually suggested that there was quite a lot of unofficial persecutions, uh, punishments, possibly even executions um, that, that didn't make it to the records. What is the Galtacht? You know, I'm not trying to be cheeky here, but this is quite an interesting question, you know, what is meant by Highland witch belief? Um, the term is more of a linguistic definition as opposed to a geographical determination. So um, if we look at this terminology more culturally, um, we can actually expand our remit further. We could look to cases of Highland witch belief occurring outside of the Highlands. So uh, good examples of this would be the Catherine McTarget case in 1688. Um, in Dunbar, she said that she uh, was uh, told to renounce her baptism by a Highland woman by the name of Margaret MacLean, or the Christian Shaw, a quite famous bewitchment case in Paisley in the, at the end of the 1600s, uh, closely involved many Highland suspects, or at least a couple of Highland suspects, including one of the key suspects, um, or in the mid 18th century, a Gall uh, Galloway witch was blamed with uh, stealing butter and sucking milk from cows in the shape of a hare. And it was said that she muttered her incantations in Gaelic. This is down in Galloway, which had never doesn't have the Gaelic language, you know, since at least the 16th century. So this is quite interesting. Now, just to sort of kind of finish off here with some specific examples um, of, you know, uh, who was hunted for uh, witchcraft in the Highlands. One of the really big cases that we have is in Butte in 1662. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because I've written about this elsewhere. So again, if you're interested, um, let me know and um, I can send you the article. But at least 20 people were um, implicated in Butte. Um, many of those suspects confess to making a, a covenant or demonic pact with the devil. So we get this demonic influence coming in, which is unusual for the Highlands. 
Um, they were baptized by the devil. They saw him on Halloween. They went on dances and all this kind of stuff with him. Uh, they were blamed for the death of children and horses, um, causing cows to produce blood and all these, all, the, all these kinds of nasty things. One of my particularly favorite things that the witches were blamed for was inflicting an illness on a man that simulated the pains of childbirth. <laughs> it's quite an unusual one, uh, but there it is in the Butte case. Um, the proximity of Butte to the mainland might be a feature here because that might have allowed more of that exchange of ideas between the lowlands and the highlands to influence its evidence. Donald Michael Michael, he's up in um, Inverary, 1677. Um, he was a, a horse rustler, basically, but because he uh, claimed that he was in communication with the fairies, he was actually executed for witchcraft. Um, the, the horse theft was a, a mere afterthought. Or um, in the Synod of Ross in 1737, who legislated against um, the scoring of s suspected witchcraft uh, cases across or witches across the forehead, this was thought to break the witch's spell. Uh, three men also appeared in Tain in 1750 for apparently doing this to a couple of women. They dragged them out of their bed in the middle of the night and scored them across uh, the forehead uh, and other terrible things that they did to them, which we won't get into. So in, there's no real conclusion here, folks. It's really, you know, this is a very brief survey and there's much, much more that we could say on this topic um, but hopefully what it has suggested to you is that um, there's a surprising amount of information about Highland witches and witch belief. And although the, the, you know, the number of formal prosecutions is quite low, um, it's larger than we once assumed. Um, and it's certainly not insignificant. So Jenny Horn, she may have been the last to suffer the pain, the terror of a brutal execution, but she was not alone. Um, many had perished before her, which persecution in Gaelic speaking Scotland is far from a blank canvas, is what I'm trying to say. Is Whether that's a conclusion, I don't know. Um, if you do want to follow up on anything that I've said, I've put here on the PowerPoint a list of my, my publications which deal with some of the things that I've talked about tonight. Um, if, you want, if you want this information, I'm very happy to share it. So do uh, do let me know. I can give you the PowerPoint or uh, copies of um, any of the articles um, if you wish to explore the topic a little further. So I think I shall stop yapping at that point. And <laughs> now that's been brilliant. Thank you, Lizanne. Um, that that was really really interesting. I I'm I just want to reiterate that that Lizanne isn't able to stay on this evening. She's very kindly agreed to come in. Um, and she will have to leave quite soon. Um, but if you do want to to email any of your questions to Lausanne, she's left her um, email on the on the chat there. But um, thank you so much, Lausanne. That's been really interesting, and it's really interesting to hear of the involvement locally around here as well. Um, thank you for all of that, and I will be looking into more. I know we've got a lot of people who are very interested in this area too, who may be in touch with you. So thanks again. Well, that would be great to hear from them. So please, uh, please do get in touch. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we really do appreciate you you coming coming to, um, to speak to us this evening. So on behalf of um, Kilmartin Museum, I'd like to thank everybody for attending um, the talk this evening and to my co-hosts here that are here. So I'll give you a wave there. Um, They've got one more day left of their placement and uh, the weather's meant to be nice tomorrow. So we should get a good walk up to Denad tomorrow as well. Um, I very much look forward to our next talk, which is by Lizzie Rose, who's the artist in residence um, at Kilmartin Museum. Um, at the moment, her exhibition's there. So I'll, I'll let you go now, but I'm sure everybody will want to say thank you. So if you want to unclick and just say thank you, um, it's nice to, to have some feedback when you've done a talk like that. So thank you very much, Lizanne. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's lots of really- Thank you very much.
we we will we will this is recorded so you'll be able to go back and have a wee look and um maybe make some notes on the different ones i took a i took a quick screenshot of um all the the information there too so thank you again and we look forward to seeing you again in november okay. thank you very much bye thank you thank you bye, -bye. thank you everybody good night good night good night, good night.